we get a little, we get a little more obvious now. Yeah. You might be wondering what else you could possibly learn at this point. I mean, now that you know how to, you change, you know how to change beliefs, you know how to reorganize time, you know how to create new states and new experiences, well, we should just give you your, your, your tights and your cape, you know, and <laughs> release you onto the world, you know, the Justice League, you know. So it is a question. What, what is it possibly that, that could be learned now? Oh, thank you, Anwar. The leftover whatever. Leftover, essentially, I like the leftover better than the main leftover. There is that, isn't there? There's going to the refrigerator, you know. Well, no, some things just need a few more days, you know, for the flavor. Come on, chili. You want it when it's just cooked, or you want it when it's, you know. Yeah, of course. You, know, you, pull, the, you pull the spoon out, and it's gone. You know, ah, now it's ready. So... But there's another way to think about this in addition to leftover, which is how to know what to do when. I mean, it's one thing to be able to change a belief, but making it so that you can do something doesn't mean that you'll devise an effective strategy to do so. You understand counterwise. If you have an effective strategy and you have a belief you shouldn't use it or you have a belief that you're not that kind of person or something and you change that belief, then as a cascade effect, that belief then changes your ability to utilize that strategy. But having the belief you can do something is no guarantee you'll develop the strategy or the behavior. You'll develop something, but how effective will it be? You can have created and have the ability to create with submodalities and states and other techniques incredible resources. But knowing that those resources are applying to the problem or to the solution that you want well, in NLP, this is, these are matters of code congruence. That is, being able to make the change at the appropriate level or in the appropriate domain to the situation. And just as an artifact of how things get taught, and we know this all too well from our own experience, have any of you ever heard the tape of this guy? He's the fastest talker in the world, and he does this like a 25-minute tape, or maybe it's a 12-minute tape, of college. And he gives you all the highlights of college in about 12 minutes. And he goes, and he goes English lit. He goes, English lit, which, of course, is something that Americans would know. You're English lit. And he goes, he goes, Chaucer, Shakespeare. And he just like, you know, Dryden. He goes, bum, 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 Hemingway. You know, and just like that, the list. And there's no connection that very often in our schooling we learn topics, but we don't learn connections. And that's what we want to begin to look at today is now that you have all these abilities, now you've expanded your sense of what's possible. It's what connects those. Now, being the kind of field we are, we're looking for natural connections. So what are the natural connectors of experience? We'll go back to Korzybski. Time is a, time is a natural connector for human beings. We're time-binding creatures. And how do we bind time? We do, we, we, absolutely, we bind experiences together, and we bind it to experience. How do we do that, though? We do that with language. We do that with language. So we have language, like this causes that, this makes that. This is the same as that. While you're taking that note, you're also wondering, where could I apply this instead of it just being another note I took? What I did, binding time. So there are ways in which language binds time. It binds time in terms of connectors. And when we formalize these, they're logic. And it binds time in terms of events, which we call stories. So a couple of the ways we bind time together is by telling a story about something, which is a series of events, by some kind of a logic, where by a syllogism that uh, uh, Aristotle is immortal, all, you know, all mortals die, therefore Aristotle will die kind of thing. Classical logic, these are ways in which we bind moments together. Now, in NLP, we're particularly interested in two kinds. 
One is, is what we call metaphor or stories. And the other we call strategies. Strategies are procedures, recipes, heuristics, rules of thumb, ways in which we take moments and we connect them together. Now they have another quality which is quite interesting and is less noted, which is that whether it's strategies or metaphors, is they not only tie moments together, but they tie them back on themselves. Now, it sounds very fancy, but let's go back to the chili example, that you're making your chili and you're stirring it and you taste it. No, needs more chili powder, and you put in more chili powder. What would just happen there? That was a feedback loop, yes. It was a feedback loop. So it not only does it bind those moments together of me with the spoon and the stirring and the beans and the tomatoes and all that and this procedure, but it also has loops in it that loop back into the experience that are about, is this, wait a minute, is this the experience I want? But wait a minute, is this the experience I want means what? It's not only binding time backward, it's binding it forward. Is this the experience I want? Is also giving direction to something that hasn't even happened yet, something that's not there. In the same way, whether you're looking at stories or whether you're looking at strategies, is it's not only about tying moments together, but tying moments together so they create a cohesive whole that gives direction to some human desire. It's an elevated way of talking about it. It's called teleology in the Greek philosophy. It's the idea of being drawn to ends, that we as creatures are drawn to produce in our lives happiness, well-being. As Aristotle said, we go to the city for the good life, to meet with others, for conviviality, for connection. And so what I want to do today is begin to explore the world of strategies for a couple of reasons. One is it binds experience together. For another, it's teleological. It's drawn towards ends, what we call in NLP, it has outcomes. It has feedback and, as we just noted, feed forward loops in it. So it's got different kinds of loops. Now there's something else that strategies does when we address it to the ideas of NLP. It draws together a number of the models of NLP. It draws together representational systems. You know that strategies were discovered by accident, like many of the great things in life probably Chile being one of them, is Robert Diltz was in a class with John Grinder, and Grinder assigned them to go out and discover something new. And so the next, over the weekend, Diltz comes back for the next Monday, and he goes, see what I mean? And they go, the class trying to figure out what it is. Grinder, background in linguistics, background in government services and so forth, looked at it and goes, hmm, and he starts doing it. And be, once you see it, of course, this is being the eye accessing cues, it's all around us. That when somebody goes, yeah, I see what you mean. I got a, feel, I got a, I got a feeling for that. Uh, say, could you tell me something? And we begin to see these systematic movements. Now, at first, and about the time I went to tra strategies, there would be whole walls of V's, A's, K's, V's, and so forth in different orders, with arrows. So the rep system, so you get something like a, and it would just go on and on and on. And given the times they were in, they began to realize the idea of computer programming. And they went, wait a minute. We could, uh, instead of it going VAK to VA, K, and they went, hey, wait a minute, we could just go.
because it's the same thing, right? And there were different types of programming that were popular at that time. In particular, a book had just been produced called Plans for the Structure of Experience, in which the authors were attempting to model one neuron, one nerve, nurse, you know, one brain cell. Now, this is significant for two reasons. Their modeling was explicitly based on the same kind of modeling as Chomsky's generative transformational grammar. Why does this matter to us? Because Grinder and Bandler had already just applied Chomsky's generative transformational grammar to create the meta model. So when they heard these guys had come up with this book that was explicitly about using that same level of modeling to understand how neurology worked, they said, we should look at this. And I want to make it take a side note here, is that what we have here is a kind of modeling that could be called abstract formalism. Now, why bother with calling? Because in the idea of abstract formalism is we're not talking about a model that's actually trying to account for all the chemical changes that are taking place in the neuron. We're not trying to account for all the little electrical charges and discharges. It's a model. You recall a model is a reduced set of an experience that allows you to understand it in a way that looking at the whole experience doesn't. In other words, by simplifying it to the point that it becomes very, very clear what you're looking at, Grinder and Bandler found what this model called the tote, divided experience of the firing of a neuron into two sets. And the one set they called the test. Now, the test goes back to that chili example. The test goes to the idea, is this chili tasting the way I want it to? And the test is, if you will, a pass-fail, right? It's a, we're testing. If it doesn't, then you go to what they call the operation. And in the operation, you have a sequence of steps in which some action is taken that will then readdress the test. So trying the chili, needs more whatever. I take the ingredients and cha 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 Stir. When I taste again, I, I test again. When I get the chili the way I want it, I exit. Now you notice, I I'm, I'm hope I'm using more than one brain cell, by the way, to make my chili. <laughs> but the, the modeling here, in fact, was the idea of one cell firing. Now, if you've ever seen a picture of the cells, there's all these things that are coming in, right? And then you have the little, the little cell. And when enough of these fire and there's enough of electrical charge, then it fires and it goes to the next cell. So actually, this is what we call a parallel processing model. This is not. There's other differences as well. But the idea, in terms of a formalism, a way of simplifying for a certain kind of understanding, this is why they ran after this particular model. Ron, you have a question there? Yeah, I do. Uh, this is sort of getting, maybe digressing a bit. But I assume that sometimes you'll exit out of a strategy even though you haven't completed the goal. In other words, you have a meta strategy that says, I've looped so many times, I haven't succeeded, therefore I'm going to exit the strategy and I'm not you're, you're getting ahead of us, but in a good way. Okay. Yeah, of course, if this is a single cell, then there's going to be a whole bunch of cells. There's going to be larger complexes of cells. And so there's this cell firing within this particular situation. And you could say there's a larger tote, if you will, that might be firing for a larger goal. For example, let me show you here. So the tote. So a tote about what this course will mean. So you have certain outcomes. Now, I'll, I'll use our word for it, but understand that that's what they meant. There's certain outcomes, test. And you go, have I got these yet? And you go, no, I haven't. So the test was, test was negative. So you're comparing to, do I have what I came here to get yet? And the answer is no. So then you go into a series of steps, uh, ask questions, 
uh, get more class time, uh, bother the instructor on breaks, I mean other ways in which you are attempting to get this outcome. At a certain point you go back into, and again, remember there's an artifice here. This, it isn't as if there's two boxes because there's only one cell, but it's a model. You go back into the outcomes again, and it's, did, are you getting this goal? If you are, then you might go on to chat with your neighbors, uh, go to lunch. In other words, as in the, in the words of the poet Deborah Holland, when our ships come in, we shall be overjoyed. Count all our blessings and dream of another place. Right? We are teleological, goal-driven creatures. And when we've satisfied lunch, we get on with life. Now, Ron, to answer your question, what's down in here? Well, you could say the VAKs are down in here, which is right. You could also say that there's more. There's more totes. That is that there's a smaller tote. And inside those, there's even smaller totes until you get down to those Now, this suggests something else that they didn't have words for back in the original NLP, which is that a number of NLP models are what is called fractal. Fractal is simply the idea of it's self-similarity of form with invariance to scale. That's the mathematical definition. What that means, you go outside and you look at a pine tree. And you, so you pick up a branch of the pine tree and you hold it up. And that little branch of pine tree looks like the branch it was just on, only the big one. And then you step back and you hold it up and it looks like the tree. In other words, it's the same shape. And many of the models in NLP, whether it's the criteria model, whether it's the strategies model, have this self-similarity. That is that you can have a tote for getting lunch, but lunch is not what's driving your life. You can have Having gotten lunch, you then are ready to study in this course. And this course is part of a larger tote called learning. And this tote is about helping you create a certain career possibility or a career for yourself, which is this then becomes one of these in a larger tote called your life direction, your destiny, your purpose. So there's totes inside of totes here, if you will. Each one at each level having an operation each one at each level having a test. Now, you also need a Q. The Q is, when is it time to run this particular strategy? So when is it time to go find lunch? Well, it might be based on the time later today. It might be based on your stomach. Uh, they now know that when we see posters of foods, these are called billboards, or television commercials, our body literally begins to release exactly the enzymes and amino acids necessary to digest what we're seeing. Yeah, we're a pretty well organized system, except that we, we never thought of they'd invent something called television. Our brains didn't, never didn't know about that. So there's lots of ways in which the body, either internally or externally, can cue, now it's time to go do this strategy. And, of course, you want to know when to exit a strategy and go on. In other words, you don't just, some people, by the way, don't have this. We've seen them, you know. They're, they, they've got a big problem, right? Because they don't have a cue as to, you know, stop eating. You've satisfied this strategy. Some people have this in other parts of life. They ask uh, Rockefeller, the original Rockefeller. How much money is enough? And he turned to his interviewer and he said, more. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's somebody who didn't really have an exit for their strategy. Now, on the other hand, there are other people that you can mention in the area of finance who have huge fortunes for whom it's a great deal of fun, right? That they, they go, wow, a new project, a new thing to do. 
So it's not about good or bad about these. It's about, you know, do you have a way in which that you know that you got what you wanted? Give you the downside of this. I work, as a number of you know, with financial decision makers, some of them quite good at what they do, some of them not so good. And some of the younger traders, they want to go into the business and they want to make a million dollars. That's their test. And they're doing all this stuff, and often they're doing it really well and working hard, but their, their tote is so large that they exhaust themselves before they ever get there. Because they, they won't reward themselves, they won't exit until they get to the million. As opposed to having a smaller tote saying, you know, set up my own office, be an independent business person, you know, have smaller totes that let them know they're having success that are building towards this larger one. Now, once again, this isn't really how neurons work. In fact, the opposite side of this, which I've indicated in previous work on metaprograms, is what we could call embodied sensory based. That is that these processes really don't work this way. That we, are, we have a body, we have eyes in front of our head, that we look forward to things, and there's all this other linguistic evidence that has nothing to do with the formalism of this model. So we're working with multiple models, something I, I hope I've made clear previously. Using this abstract model of strategies, though, we get certain insights into experience, and we get the ability to do certain things. For example, one of the real contributions Grinder and Bandler made to this work was, what are these steps made of? How do we know that we've got an outcome? Well, we, we say what we see, what we hear, what we feel, that lets you know you got what you wanted. Whew. That's why Gregory Bateson wrote the introduction to Structure of Magic Book One. He went, it was one of those things where, duh, right in front of them, they'd been looking at communication theory for years and years for a way to ground this theory, and it never occurred to them that it could be the representational system. It never occurred to them. As I was saying, that strategies binds many different kinds of models together. Right under the rep system, of course, it binds the submodalities. They found Bandler one day standing in front of these V's, A's, and K's. They go, Richard, it's cocktail hour. Come on. We got a cool one waiting for you. Richard's looking, goes, Richard, what are you looking? He says, I want to know what's in the arrows. <laughs> well, this really comes to our, our, our experience. This comes to our work. This is what set, sets us apart. We want to know what's in it. How do you get? from one experience to the other. And what did they find? When the picture gets bright enough, when the voice gets loud enough, when the feeling gets bubbly enough, whatever that is for us, then we go to the next phase. We go to the next step. We may exit the strategy. Or conversely, as you know, from motivation, from the idea of the serotonin versus the dopamine nephrinephrine. It might be when things get relaxed enough, when things fit together, when they're harmonious. In other words, the submodalities. Another way that strategies ties these models together is in terms of what we call criteria. That is, for any one of these experiences here, any one of these many tests, you're going to have criteria. In the words of Michael LeBeau, people do not do things for outcomes. They do things for criteria. If somebody wants a new car, it's not simply because it's a new car. It's because what? It's because it gets them from one place to another. It attracts chicks. You know, it makes them feel good. It's all, what are all those? Those are all criteria. The actual car is an outcome which the person has, in their mind, realized or converged on as a way of fulfilling that criteria. So the criteria model
And in many ways, strategies also ties together metaprograms with the rest of them. Specifically, we've been talking about time, talk about perceptual position, authority, content. After all, you're going to make a decision about what? About a car, about a relationship, about a work possibility? That's metaprogram. Who's going to make that decision? You or somebody else? Metaprogram, right in there again. Is that decision going to be made on past information, future opportunities, present excitement? Again, metaprograms and so forth. So what we want to do is to begin to explore and utilize this model called strategies, realizing that in many cases, well, this, would be, this might have been a review uh, for many of the, was this a review? A little yes and no. Yeah, because this is the basis uh, from which we want to proceed. So I'll pause your questions. All right, so given that there aren't any at this moment, We want to look at this model. We realize this model's fractal. And we realize the two things. One, that as a structural model, it will have structural properties, which can be, therefore, addressed in terms of the different kinds of difficulties and possibilities it creates. For example, Ryan, you take the idea of an automobile. An automobile has structural properties. You, you're going to look for some way that you're generating power whether that's by a combustion engine or by electric engine or somehow. You're going to look for a process of translating that power into the turning of some kind of a shaft because you're trying to turn in a torque because torque is what we use to get across land. And you're going to be looking for that torque to be translated into a means of connecting with the road. All right? So you've got several properties here. So you can go, all right, if I'm looking at a car in the abstract, therefore I would want to look at it and go, okay, uh, where's the problem? Is the problem in that, the, that I'm not generating enough power or that my I'm losing too much power in the translation from the engine to the torque? And how is that translating to the wheels? You, same, that, well, this is, by the way, this is abstract formalism. I'm doing it right now. Abstract formalism would be computer programming, neuro-linguistic programming. We're based on a computer programming model. So memory is what? Memory is the process of somehow having an input having recorded that input, and then having some way of verifying something matches that input. Therefore, you need an input mechanism. You need a register of some kind, a memory register. You need some way to compare those registers. And then you need some way to let the system know that you did. So it's input, computation, memory, output. So again, an abstract formal model. Decision processes. What is a decision process? Decision process is where you have, in a particular domain, figured that you want to be able to generate viable options. You're generating viable options. And then have a means of choosing among them to find out which option is most viable for the situation that you're in. And then implement. So as decisions are something that we make all the time, as decisions are basic to human experience, and as the tote applies, whether it's decision strategy, a motivation strategy, or convincer strategy, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with the decision strategy as an example. So let's fill in this a little bit. We're going to have our outcome. We're going to have our criteria. And we're also going to have our evidence. In other words, evidence is sensory based. What we see, what we hear, what you feel, that let you know that you got your outcome. If your outcome's a new car, that can be satisfied by, geez, how many car manufacturers are there now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
Over 100, perhaps? So there's lots and lots of that can satisfy that. What about satisfying your criteria? Again, you're, you're going to know your criteria is satisfied by whether or not your evidence indicates the criteria is satisfied. So there's actually these three that you're looking at in terms of the outcome, the criteria, the evidence in the upper part of the tote. Now, one of the innovations of NLP was to realize that most people, what they do is they notice the operation and then ascribe it. So ascribe, attribute. So Gene, you're a good talker. You should be an entertainer. In other words, you, they took the, the operation and turned it into the outcome. Oh, you're good with people. You should be a nurse, right? Or a salesperson. Oh, you're, you're good at math. You should go into computer programming. So very often in life, we hear where people have seen what somebody does well, an operation they do well, and say, oh, you ought to make that your goal. It's an approach. NLP took an alternate approach and said, what if you hold your outcome, your test, constant, and vary your behavior? I mean, you, you heard the example of the drug test. They were, there's a medicine. It's on the market these days. And, and they were doing trials. And it's, it's about heart. There's a lot of medicines around the heart because heart attacks, due to certain dietary things in our culture, are popular. And so these different people, they were, they were doing tests. And it was, it was to uh, relax and open the blood vessels and lower the uh, blood pressure. You know, and, the, and the guys would come in. He goes, Doc, Doc, I got more hair. And he goes, OK, because the doctors are doing it. They write it down, send it to a drug company. Other guys come in and go, Doc, Doc, I got more hair. Six weeks into the trials for this drug, the trials are stopped. A couple years later, it comes back. It's a topical. <laughs> right. So there's these guys and some gals walking around. They're using this shampoo. They're using this ointment. And they got more hair. You know what else? They got lower blood pressure because the drug don't know. In other words, they reassign the outcome. Now, there was another drug that's on the market now that was used to increase heart circulation, more blood, more oxygen to the system. I don't know what the doc said. He's like, doc, doc, you can't believe how great my, my love life is. I, w I wanted to be the chief chemist of Pfizer when they went in and told the executives, you won't believe what we have here. So there's all these guys and gals now with a better love life. And guess what? They're also getting more oxygen to the brain, eventually. <laughs> because the drug don't know. This is an example of the idea of reapplying the process and making it the outcome you can see that it has certain viability in the world. The other way, though, is to say, well, you know, I really want to do this. You know, whether it's start a business, whether it's create a new kind of life situation for yourself or your family, and go, you know, I don't know a whole lot about that. And we take the idea, well, then you could model it. You could go and find out the operations and the tests that other people are using to achieve that, and you could start to do that yourself. And as you begin to fill in these totes, with the details of what to pay attention to and what's the criteria and what evidence to notice, that you too can develop this skill. This is the idea behind strategy. And that you can specify those strategies in terms of the rep systems, in terms of the submodalities to pay attention to, what criteria, and which meta programs to occupy. Which is to say that strategies is a modeling tool. It's a way of modeling a system. OK. So I previously noted that there's three kinds of, of strategies.
that fit together. Decision, motivation, conviction, or conviction, decision, motivation, or motivation, conviction, decision. And that uh, they tend to be wrapped around each other, and that these are three in particular to pay attention to. And that each utilizes the tote in a different way. That the decision strategy creates options in the operation, and then divides those options in the test. In other words, which one is most viable? With motivation, the operation is creating more and more impetus to go into action either by moving towards or away, thank you, moving towards or away, either by an analog process or a digital ratcheting up in one of the rep systems. So when the picture gets bright enough, when the picture gets close enough or the sound gets loud enough, one takes action. Or counterwise, when the feeling is uncomfortable enough or good enough, boom, into action. Conviction, convincer strategies, take the operation as a counter, as a way of determining the number of examples that meet criteria that will allow the person to form, as I said, a generalization, a belief. So that it can be that this is a good restaurant, this is a trustworthy person, this is good value, uh, these are the kind of people I have to hang out with, these are the kind of people you can't trust. Any one of those is run by running the operation a number of times or for a certain duration that you've built up a number of examples or a sufficient period of time that you exit to a generalization. All of them using test, operate, test, exit. All of them needing a cue, an exit, criteria, representational systems, submodalities. So, I want to do a quick demonstration here on the assumption that you do remember what the accessing cues are. Yeah? Okay, quickest review. This is? Visual. visual. This is? Kinesthetic. Okay. So this is your visual. So your head, first of all, take the head, and you've got your visual up here, right? And you've got your auditory to the side. You've got down here auditory, right? Now, some people say, well, what about reverse? Keep in mind that a vast majority, we're talking in the 85, 90%, even though we're a non-statistical field, are going to be organized this way. So major pattern, then minor pattern. In other words, learn to drive a stick shift before you learn to drive a truck. In other words, you learn the basic pattern, and then you can modify it based on the person. Down this way, kinesthetics down this way. Again, we're just doing this as the primary way of sorting it here. Now, you take that and you apply that to the body. Once again, you get your visual, your auditory listening, auditory internal dialogue, kinesthetic, then apply that to the body. And you've got auditory leg, kinesthetic leg. Right? You can expand that. Now, gesturally, if I'm doing something like this, hand, palms down, visual. So it's like, it's like I'm drawing, right? It doesn't matter if I do it down here or if I do it up here. It's still visual. If I flip the palms, it's kinesthetic. It doesn't matter if I do it here where it looks real kinesthetic or I'm on the kinesthetic leg, I'm looking down here, I'm going, or if I do it up here, it's still, yeah, no, it's still kinesthetic. Palms up, palms down visual, all right? Now, what if I'm doing this? I'll be very neutral here. Well, there's some subtle cues, but on the obvious sense, there really isn't anything. And what if I'm doing this? Auditory, right. It's internal. No, 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 no. Now, it doesn't matter whether I do it here or whether I do it here. You're looking at the degree of the rhythm 
You know, people are doing that counter thing, you know, and you think they're trying to upset you. No, they're just listening to, to, doc, they're listening to Eminem or Dr. Dre. They're just amusing themselves, you know, just let them go. Kinesthetic, yes. A sigh, kinesthetic. Touching the body, the body in socially appropriate or inappropriate places, <laughs> kinesthetic. Now, touching the face, auditory, yes, I always like a, all the NLP trainers who go, hi, I'm auditory. All those photos, you know. Doesn't matter which hand. This one's kind of interesting, though. This usually is kind of shut up, stop talking to yourself, you know. But um, any kind of stroking the face, touching the face, pointing at the ear, things like that. Head, different than. <sighs> Kinesthetic, right. Now, so we've got three ways to be able to determine this, right? We've got the. Eyes, eye accessing, got physiology, and we've got the uh, predicates, which is a fancy word for the words. So does this look good to you? You're getting a feeling for this. Questions, observations, reactions. Now they're all going on at the same time. And they're all pretty quick because it's an unconscious competence. Except when the person gets into difficulty, in which case they slow right down and people notice what they're doing and then they think they're going to plan on how to get out of what they're doing. I'm here to tell you right now that most people's conscious attempts at thinking are fixes for a more basic strategy situation, which is best remedied structurally, not by adding another layer to it. Well, yeah, a lot of people, they'll develop some strategy to try and take care of their strategy that doesn't work. So if somebody can't decide at a restaurant what to get, they said, well, my strategy is I always ask the waitress. And I'm going, that's because you can't decide. <laughs> now, that can work, provided you can calibrate the waitress, and you know the waitress or waiter has your taste. These are all like, very, if you think about it, it's a tricky situation. Because you look, turn to the uh, waiter or waitress, and you go, so what's good? And they're going, what's good is I get a big tip. So, you know, they, so they're going, well, you know, the, the surf and turf is really good, as opposed to, you know, what do you like to eat? And then you find out, first of all, whether or not the person likes to eat the kind of things that you like to eat. Does this make any sense? All right. Is there still more external? No, internal. What do you want? How do you know what you want? So what I want to do is bring someone up in just a moment to do a quick decision elicitation. Uh, that is to say a successful decision elicitation. And then I want to contrast that with a decision where the person is still experiencing difficulties. Because what I want to point out is twofold here. One is that this is a fractal model. In other words, if a person has a difficulty making an everyday decision, that's merely going to be amplified, if it's a structural problem, which is my claim, in larger decisions. Or to speak in terms of submodalities, you know the difference between a small decision and a big decision? You want to see it again? It's well, a big decision. Yeah? So it amplifies any difficulty. This particularly I found to be the case when I was modeling financial decision makers. Any glitch in their strategy would be, mod would be amplified by the money involved. Well, think about it. If I say, OK, this is going to be, we're only going to bet uh, 10 bucks on this, OK? 10 bucks. 100 bucks. 1,000 bucks. 1,000 dollars. $10,000. Now, can you hear what I'm doing with my voice? Don't you even hear this on the game shows? And now, for $1 million. We do that. We make the submodalities. We make the voice louder. 
because that helps us make better decisions, right? <laughs> no. Okay, so here's what you're doing. You're thinking about what's a simple everyday decision that you make easily. Now, I don't mean a habit. I don't mean like, yes, I get up every day at 7 o'clock. I mean a decision that you make, right? It doesn't have to be every day, but a decision that you make. Like maybe you make a decision what to wear, right? Or you make a decision about like where you might go to lunch. You make a decision about what you're going to do on your break. Like, oh, it's a beautiful day. I go outside on my break today. That, that kind of thing. You know, for instance, the clothes I'm wearing. When did I make this decision to wear these clothes today? <laughs> Worse than that, Anne. I made this decision back in the middle of July. Well, because I had to have it ready when I arrived back in Chicago to put in the suitcase to bring here. So, you see, and this is the tricky part about this stuff. Is that what I'm talking about here is the cue. So when was the cue to, to, to make this decision to be here today? Well, for me, it wasn't today. It was in July. So I didn't make that decision today. Now, you know, what decisions did I make today? Well, I mean, today I brought a little snack for myself. I had a choice of snacks. And so I looked in the drawer and I went, that one. You know, and that decision, little everyday decision, you know, what, what, what little food or whatever am I going to bring along with me, what book am I going to read, whatever, that decision I made today. That was an actual cued today decision, whereas the one that would seem obvious, like, you know, so how did you choose those clothes? When did you decide to do to, to these clothes? And I go, oh, it was that July 14th or 17th. You're looking at me like, I decided that then, but that's the way we are. Oh, that's the way everyone is. In your case, you had to decide to have those shoes here before you left for a program that began in July. Right, so in your case as well, all your clothes you decided over almost a month ago. Now, you may have not decided what to wear today. Today it may have been fluid, but it was out of the set of possibilities that you'd already decided on. And I have to imagine, given how nicely you dress, that you mentally tried on or even physically tried on. Or, or maybe you do what, what Cher from the, the movie uh, Clueless did, is you take Polaroids of everything. <laughs> no, you don't. OK. So anyway, somehow or another, you decided that these went together. They made a nice grouping. right? So you made that decision long before pe other people might have. You know, Steve Andreas is going to be up at the train later this week. I'm sure that Wednesday morning he'll go, and he'll take his clothes, and he'll go, because he didn't have to make that decision until then. So there's efficiencies, there's, there's different uh, environmental constraints, there's personal habits. But the point I'm getting at in this is that the cue doesn't necessarily show up when you would think it would. Well, that, that is that the cue is something that isn't what, it might not be the same for you. In other words, you think, oh, I, I make my decision about where to go to lunch around lunchtime. Other people might have made it last week going, I'm going to every restaurant in town and I haven't gone there yet. So, I mean, they, they could be running a completely different strategy for the very same thing. Of course, that we're getting into the structure of talent, finding out how somebody else does it and being able to apply that to yourself so you can have more flexibility, more ways of doing things. Yeah. So, a simple decision you've made and then a decision that you're having difficulties with. You might be in the midst of it. You might have just put it off because you can't decide, right? Whatever it is. Well, I want you to have one of each. I want you to have one where you easily and directly have made a decision. It's done. You know, it was recent, so you can think about it. And another one where you're uh, you know, it's, it may have been in process for years, or it may be that it just came up in the last day. doesn't matter. Because what we're going to do is we're going to contrast them structurally. So if you got these, everybody got something like that. Let's go around and look. Yeah? Rick, you want to come up and play as you're the, the, the new guy on the block here? <laughs> come on up and have a seat. We're just going to take a, a moment and wire you for sound, because that's what we do here. Yeah, I think so. 
Just tie it around his neck. Okay. <clears throat> All right, now, we can look at this as a simple geo. You're familiar with that? Robert Diltz, Tim Holbom, Susie Smith, what they did is that they realized that too many Americans respond when you go, test, operate, test, that they would exit. <laughs> so they decided to call it a geo because a geo reminds us of the earth, it reminds us of those rocks you can buy in the stores, and of low-priced cars. So the geo, meaning goal, operation, exit, we're gonna, use the, we're gonna stay with the idea of the tote. This is advanced strategies, but same principle. And that we've got, we're gonna be doing a simple at the beginning, contrastive analysis between a not getting results situation, a decision that doesn't work, and a results that is getting situation, one that does. Now, you notice this is very basic to NLP, contrastive analysis. What you want to do is you want to keep the domain spaces, the two different, as, as similar as possible. So in this case, we're asking for a decision and a decision. I would remind you, just because we ask for a decision doesn't mean you get one. <laughs> That's one of the parts to pay attention to. We are asking, though, for a decision, and we'll, we'll take it from there, won't we? Won't we? We will. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, a little advanced stuff, because this is, is supposed to be advanced strategies, and that is to say that the idea of this, you can always test for the arrangement of the person's rep system systems by asking questions for which you know the representational answer. So for example, Rick. Hi. You look old enough to have owned a few cars in your life. True. What was the first car? It was a 41 Ford. Wow. And what color was the interior? I don't remember. I think it was a light tan. All right. Now, you notice, though, where he went for that information, what we call eidetic, remembered space. And he went there originally for the 41, and then the interior says, well, I don't know, because it isn't here. And he says, well, let me go back. And you can see the eyes are, you know, and he goes up there. So this is a very quick way. Now, if he'd gone over here and started giving me the answer of what it looked like, I might, I'd be asking more questions, all right? But that's a quick way to begin to orient and go, okay, the person, the standard kind of organization. Okay. So give us a couple of words of content about the decision process. And by the way, I'm sitting here so that I'm out of the way. And otherwise, if I was sitting over here, what would happen? He'd look at me, and that would distort. So a lot of NLP techniques, you do them where you're to the side of the person because it gives you their whole mental space to work with. The idea you can help them put pictures there, you can help them see the goal, you're not interrupting. But strategies, you actually want to get in a relationship to the person where you can see what's going on. Also, soft eyes. Too many people I've watched, they're concentrating here. Meanwhile, the person, they're dancing, you know, and all these cues, because remember, you've got, you've got three kinds of cues that you're watching and listening for. Eye axis and cues, also head tilts, physiology, head tilts, body movements, legs, movement, and words. So, this decision that you uh, that was easy for you to make, yes, recent one, yes. Um, how did you know when it was time to make it? About uh, forty-five minutes ago. All right, great, great. Just a little content. What's give us a word or two, a phrase, so we can hang something on it. Snack. Snack. I wonder if that has something to do with me. Uh, <laughs> okay, so how do you know? Now, how do you know does what? Access is the cue. 
So how do you know when it's time to think about Sinet? I put myself in the place of um, past events, and, and I remember that I want food in the middle of the morning, uh, this kind of training. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I ask myself, what kind, you know, what do I want? Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, my wife was, was with me, and so, so she suggested, you know, a, a pear that's ready to go and a, an apple that's, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so I, I thought about them. They're, they're good, they're nutritious, and mm -hmm. uh, give me energy, and so it felt right. <laughs> Wasn't that beautiful? Isn't that that's so great? <laughs> oh, you didn't see it. It was all there. It was all there. The, 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 even down to when he's going, criteria, 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 criteria. And so, but that's the thing. It's all there. But it may be subtle. It may be somebody who's like really obvious. You're, you're very nice because you, there, you can see it, but it's not like you're going, well, I look at the picture and I get a feeling. Um, <laughs> okay. But no, but you're, you're obvious enough. Okay. This is good. Your, your wife can figure out where you're coming from, yes? It's pretty wise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, you help. You, more than you know. <laughs> okay, now, if we could just go back and take the audio strip of that, just you know, listen to the audio of it, we would get the process, the procedure, and what did you hear? What did you get in terms of a process, a procedure, listening to that? I'm going to step in back to here. Anyone? Yeah, Jim. Well, my sense is he went future first. He saw me do this training, and he saw the whole other training he's been at. OK, so, so let's, and that's great. I'm going to endeavor to capture some of this, the, uh, the snack. So uh, uh, future trainings. And you understand we're already abstracting from what he said, and I agree. And? And then he went, uh, then he went back to trainings, and he thought, you know, I'd like to have a snack when I'm in trainings like this. So he didn't do past experience. Right. And, and then his wife was there. He wants something, to, something to eat in the middle of the night. Yeah, this is great. See, he, this is where he's a multiple person strategy. You know, he says, he says, I wonder what I'd like as a snack. Now, some people say this to themselves. Clearly, he was not saying this to himself. He was external. I wonder what I'd like for a snack, I said to myself out loud. So that would be the auditory digital, but out loud, right? And the wife made a suggestion. And what did he do? Ah. What did he do? Now, this is where this is what I'm saying. He. He wondered about this, and then he, he what, you, you did say it. He went to his criteria. Right, then he, he listed his criteria, he checked criteria, right, and then he, he decided. Now, how did he decide? This is another way we're straight, right, this is another place strategies pulls together feelings as well as, as the usual rep systems, he had a feel, mm, yeah, we like that. Okay. Now, if we were to watch the visual portion of that, what did we see? Looking back when he started, first felt, I, I, didn't, I couldn't see all of it. Fine. But my guess is we had to say, look here to say, I'm going to be in a training today, and then look here. To say, and I would say, you, you could guess, I can confirm that having been another angle, he went, yeah, when he talked about past trainings, he went, yeah. right? And also, by the way, we're asking about a strategy that he already did. So before he can associate into being in the moment of that strategy, he has to go back and get it. Right, so at first, it's going to be a past access. It has to be. He's going to be a past experience. So past access. Then he's in the experience. And then it's like, well, man, training, I have snack. Talking to himself a little bit. Then he got to this part where he what would, I, you know, what would I like, he says out loud. And his wife goes, fruit. And he does what? In, in, the, in, the, in the visual track. What does he do? If you were looking at, the, at just the visual, at the movie. He went, fruit. 
boop, boop, boop. Right, he's looking at it. He's looking at it. He's, t he's taking fruit, and he's going, okay, fruit, and then he, he paints fruit into that pit. And then he goes, now he's got the fruit, and he goes, mm, man, good. Here he is. Yeah? Okay. So we know several things here. His strategy that works is for getting a snack. His goal, or his, his geo, or in this case his test, is whether or not he gets the snack, has, has a snack that meets his, in this case, he's very explicit about his criteria. What was that criteria again? Rick, you know what it is. Well, it tastes good, it's nutritious, and gives me energy. And energy. And then, he went and he had his operation here. All right. So you've made a few notes. Yeah? Pretty straightforward. Now we're going to come back and we're going to do the other side of this and go, so Rick, what's a decision where you experiencing difficulty, incompleteness, uh, whatever that is? And again, give us uh, just a, a word or a phrase so we know what to hang it on. Um, travel. Travel, OK. So we have a word. Now, how do you know when it's time to think about making this decision? Well, it's time. Uh, this, I have like three days to complete that decision. Okay. 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 And the, the choice is my wife and I drove to Colorado from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm here this week, and she left this morning for Aspen for the music festival. Mm -hmm. She's a, mu a musician, a pianist. So it's, it's a fairly long drive from Aspen to Winter Park and back. And there's a lot of good things happening up there, so we would like to have her have that time there. And at the same time, uh, I wanted to have a reasonably convenient way to get to Aspen Snowmass because we'll spend a, I'll, I'll be up there for another three or four days mm -hmm. after this training. So I started by uh, checking out Amtrak, and sure enough, there's a train to Glendale, Sp uh, Glenwood Springs, mm -hmm. and uh, and unfortunately, I delayed getting the reservation until that the Saturday train was full. So I got one on Sunday, and which means I have to stay over another night, or uh, she can drive if you know all the way back to get me, or I can get a a, a, a ride from. Home James, or from you know some other traveler over to Empire mm -hmm. to save maybe an hour or two hours round trip or something. So so we're get, we're still gathering information and we don't know. Uh, you know I'm I'm wanting to preserve uh, the good things in her life at Aspen, and uh, and at the same time I'd like to get there, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know so so all the all these factors are, are still rolling around and. And so we're, we're, we're getting, we have some information to get together before we talk to each other tonight and tomorrow night and make a choice. But it's not made, it's an, it's an incomplete. Okay. My question, now you can, you hear some differences already between the previous one and this one. For example, what do you hear in terms of, of differences? Now, over here we've got the idea of travel. Now, would you say his tote is clear or unclear? Yeah, yeah, this is what I'm getting at. This is why you want to separate the, the tote or the goal. We also call it the goal, call it the outcome. That you separate that from the criteria. Now, in your basic training, they didn't do that, but we want to do that here. Because what's his goal? Get to, get to Aspen, get together with wife. I mean, you know, in, in fact, it's quite clear. What about the criteria involved? Okay, so we've got, we've got uh, preserve something, and that's her experience, and time together, and? Cost, because he's talking, he inferred cost, and I don't have to pay for another night, 
uh, you know, availability of transport, cost of transport. So what? So if you look at this and you look at this, what do you already notice about the criteria differences? It's a big list, and no, there's more too. Yeah, I know there's more. So there's a lot of criteria compared to a few, and what else? There's competing criteria. So I'm, so I'm, that's why I say I'm, I'm drawing you towards a certain set of insights. That is that when people have difficulties in strategies, very often what you're looking at are structural difficulties. That is they're, they're, that's why the abstract formalism is useful. The model is useful because the model goes, OK, is the outcome clear? This works, this doesn't. Yeah. Is the criteria, oh, well, wait a minute, the criteria very, you know, tastes good, nutritious, energy, right? Or you could put them in an energy, nutritious, taste good. In other words, even though you slice and dice this some way or another, a number of things will come together when you do just a Venn diagram of that. And you go, OK. You know, and then you've got you know, fruit or whatever in that, in that intersection of the three criteria. right? So you've got taste good, nutritious, energy. All three meet that. Over here, you've got many more criteria. And you've got competing criteria. You've got criteria of cost versus time together. You've got criteria of, of the course here and something for her. You've got the availability of the transport is yet another variable influencing these. And so the competing criteria is that, in a sense, he keeps reordering the criteria. One becomes more important, whereas these are held constant. Does that make sense? And so, also he's got a, another little variable there called this is, a, this is a, between two people. Actually, it's between at least three. It's between you and your wife and the transportation systems available. Okay. So there may be that as well. So he's got extra parties on the outside. And the operation, we can see the operation does what? It just it keeps going. But you know, I didn't do this, and I could have done that, and you know, we'll need to eventually decide out of what's left. Because there may not be availability, right? And it's not just my decision. Exactly. Because we need to meet her, some of her criteria. Right, too. right. And I, I think that's wonderful. I just want to point that out. Sure. As, not as a negative either, but as something else you're paying attention to. Yeah. Stru makes it slightly structurally different. Mm -hmm. Very much. Now, having pointed all that out, I do need to ask, is this actually a strategy that's a difficulty, or is it simply that you two haven't had time to talk? And... Um. Or... Let me ask that differently. Is this feeling that you're having, is this kind of situation familiar to you? Yes. A, uh, the, the, initial, uh, the initial strategy or the mm -hmm. initial decision was that I was just going to stay over and then take the train on Sunday, mm -hmm. just get a ride to Fraser and take the train up. and and um, and. My wife uh, it, it has, has a, str a great ability to go into other. So, mm -hmm. so uh, plus, uh, she says she's going to be lonesome. So, uh, so for both those reasons, she, she, uh, she has a strong inclination to drive back. I think if I could get, a ride, for example, a ride to Empire, there'd be no question that she would drive to Empire and, and then back. Mm -hmm. uh, to save me the time and, and, and the cost and the kind of empty day of staying in, uh, in Winter Park. So, so yeah, her. so that, that element is, uh, figures into, into almost every mutual decision. There's, there's a lot of stepping into other and stepping back mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So that, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, yeah. So did you see what he did this? He went and said, well, there was an easy solution. Let's do this. But he's already dissociated from it slightly. Yeah, but this isn't going to you know, satisfy, satisfy this relationship component. And we do want that satisfied. Yes. Yes. So why did I ask what I did? 
Because if the problem is structural, the person is going to be generating the same feelings. Remember, NLP is a field that claims that the experiences you have are a consequence of structure. Experience has a structure. If you change the structure, you change the experience, yes? Okay, that applies here as well. Experience has a structure. We're looking at the structure of a strategy. If the person is running this structure, then they're going to be getting certain experiences, including a going on and on and on and on in steps and certain feelings, because that's what this structure in yourself and between you and your spouse will produce. Right. All right. Now, we're going to pause on this, because this is, what I, this is the first part. Is that what I want you to do in your groups is the very same thing. Is you're going to do a very simple, and I realize this is not detailed. We're closing in on structural principles. It is a simple kind of elicitation of something that works, and you notice what that looks like, and you notice what the nonverbals look like, and you get an idea of the strategy. And one where there's difficulty, either incompleteness or a sense of can't make a decision, and find out what that looks like. And then, having written those down, being able to dissociate, take an observer position, and look at these and go, oh, I can see that this is different, that the, I'm doing different things in this situation. And then, Rick, if you'd like to come back up, then I will offer some ways in which you can upgrade this strategy to make it work more effectively, still meeting the important outcomes here. Okay. So you'll have that opportunity to consider whether you like the way it works now or whether you might appreciate something that would bring you and your wife to quicker conclusions on stuff in a way that's satisfying. Understanding that it's a structural change we're going to be making, not a change in your relationship. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Eric. I heard him uh, add criteria, and it seemed like the, the criteria he added had a different weight or priority. Yeah, Eric, Eric what he's do doing constantly, and you're, you're correct in that, is he's adding more criteria and then reweighing it, and adding more criteria and reweighing it. And when his wife enters the situation, the criteria gets reweighed again. So yes, what I pointed out before is there's a constancy of criteria in the easy decision, and there's a shifting sense of the importance of criteria, which also implies the solution already, which is a hierarchy of criteria. So jumping ahead as usual, glad to see you're here. Uh, we'll come back to this. In the meantime, uh, thank Rick for coming up here and being such an elegant demonstration. Thank you. Yeah. And are there questions about what to do for the exercise? Because that's where we go next. We're going to dive right in. All right. All right. You can also look on the second page of your notes in which I've offered you a simple uh, uh, summary of the GEO approach. And there's a series of questions there. And we let's go over them now in the sense of the first question, the Q, is about when. How do you know it's time? Anything to do with time, when, when is it time to make the decision? And what you're watching for is the person going back into that strategy. If they go, well, you know, I could make it here and I could make it there, then they're not actually in the experience. They're still making it up, floating about, having a good time, but not going back to that moment. So you also want to find a specific example of the decision, not in general, a specific time. So he started out a little general, and then he went to the snack. OK, good, he's on a specific snack. This is what we want. As he relives that experience, you can ask them, how did you decide? What was the next step? What came before that? In a way, what you're doing is you're listening for, am I hearing the outcome? Am I getting a series or sequence of steps? And how does the person know when they've decided? So it's the, it, we're basically looking at the four structural features here, which is, how do you know when it's time to decide? What is it you're going for? How do you know that you're getting it? And what are the steps that you're going for? through to get to it, the operation. So the goal, the operation, the exit, to which I would also add the cue. How do you get into it? How do you get out of it? Now, you can go into more detail, and we will. 
this both is functioning as a review and an orientation. Do the successful simple strategy first because it gives you a nice baseline, right? You see what it looks like when it's simple. Then go to the strategy with difficulty. You're not fixing anything. At this point, it's a discovery exercise. It's a practice exercise. You're practicing eliciting a strategy, getting the basic sense of it, finding out the criteria, reacquainting yourself with accessing cues. And then on the other hand, you're beginning to notice what are the differences between when it's easy for the person and when they run into difficulty. This is probably not the only kind of difficulty that he runs into. We have a number of ways to make a hash of our experience. But this is probably a typical one, which, which goes to my question of, so how is, is this a familiar feeling? Because I was wondering if this is something where he visits this a lot, which would indicate that he uses strategy more often. All right, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just being up there, I noticed that you, it, was, it was more like you got me to tell a story. Mm -hmm. I, mean, you, uh, I might have been tempted had I looked at that structure to ask ask right up front what were your criteria. Right. But those came out very naturally at, at, at kind of at the tail end of the story. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think they came out at the appropriate time because when you started out with your snack, you weren't thinking, what's my criteria? You were thinking, snack. And you, although you had criteria that you were holding already, because we do that. We, we have something we wanted. It has the criteria. It has the evidence that we have already. And then when you go into it, at a certain point, different than some people, Rick, you explicitly tested for your criteria. Very Michael Lebeau of you, by the way. Successful businessman approach. A lot of people do not. They just have their criteria, and they go, well, I, I got what I wanted. I didn't get what I wanted. And the test is just the feeling. You actually tested for the criteria and then tested for the feeling. That's why I thought it was so nicely done. You want to find out how you do it. You want to find out how your partners do it. I'm going to invite you to do this in groups of three for a couple of reasons. One is that I just want you to be, have two eyes and ears on this as you tune up. Still, I want a leader. I want to have one person who is the guide, who is guiding the explorer, and is asking the questions. That leaves the other person free to notice stuff, to make notes. We want to make notes. All right. Now, what happens if you get lost? Okay, yes, that's right. You exit, yeah, and start again. You can always remember, once you've got the beginning of the strategy, then you can always go, well, let's go back to the beginning of this snack thing, Rick. So, so okay, uh, so, how, yeah, how do you know it's time? You can always start over and run it again. That's the, that's the beauty of this. When, once you realize that you can control for the language, that you can ask questions. Now, one more thing, and you'll get to go. What if I had turned to Rick and say, so, Rick, uh, how do you know when it's time to, to have a snack? I'm leading the witness, yes, because people are cooperative. We know that from our previous experiments. We try to get along. So if I go, oh, Rick, how do you know when it's time to snack? No, so you want to quiet yourself first so that you're not, as much as possible, leading the witness. And ask general questions. How do you know when it's time? What's your experience? What are you aware of? These non-specified kind of language that allows them to fill in the details. Learning by doing, this is a practice thing. Groups of three, new friends and neighbors this time around, and let's get to it. I'm thinking about 45 minutes for the whole thing. Let's go.